Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's good to be here. Why, uh, why do we live here in northern Minnesota? Uh, it's a, if I were to ask each of you that, I'd probably get a lot of different answers. But a lot of them would start to form a theme, I think. <clears throat> and the theme would be, life here is pretty good. You know, we've got great hunting and fishing. We've got our families here, our traditions here. We've got our communities here. Life in northern Minnesota is pretty good. E.M. Forrester once wrote, either life entails courage or it ceases to be life. And the truth of the history of this place is that northern Minnesota has involved courage for a long time. And courage is a part of our past, our present, and needs to be a part of our future as we move forward. I've got to tell a quick little story. I tell it a lot, and it's a, it's a cliche almost. But I grew up on a junkyard. It's true. The Brown and Sun Salvage Yard, located on Highway 7, down central St. Louis County, the Bobby Arrow Memorial Highway, it's been, since been renamed. There were two trailer houses on the junkyard. One was filled to the ceiling with hubcaps, and the other one was filled with our family. And that's where we lived. And uh, that's where I spent my childhood. And uh, through a variety of uh, fortunate experiences, I got to go off to college. My first year at college, off in Iowa, private school, far away, uh, relatively far away. And, and I was at this college, and uh, inexplicably, this boy who grew up in the 80s and 90s on the Iron Range, who never thought he was going to come back, found, I found myself at a party. I was talking to this beautiful girl. And I don't know how long it took, but at, at one point I found myself explaining the taconite process <laughs> to this beautiful girl, which worked out exactly how you'd think it would, by the way. <laughs> and so I am back on the Iron Range. I guess I really was intended to come back. And in my adult life, I've since spent uh, life as a journalist and as an educator attending a variety of meetings and conferences and seminars about the economic future of northern Minnesota. And so here we are at a wonderful opportunity to maybe break up the repetition of some of those meetings that I know many of you here uh, attend on a regular basis. And so I, I think we do need to go back and tell a little bit about the history of the area, though. It's very important, and I think it's important to start from the very beginning. <laughs> billions and billions, another Carl Sagan joke, of years ago, uh, a, a star exploded. Uh, actually, several stars exploded. Aaron Wenger's in the house, and he will correct my errors that I am sure to make in the next few moments. Uh, a supernova occurred, and a supernova occurs when the, the nuclear process in a star plays out, and heavier and heavier elements are created, until at one point, a certain element is created that's just too heavy, too heavy, and the star kablooey. The element, the star killer, this is according to Neil deGrasse Tyson from his book, Death by Black Hole, the star killer is iron. And iron uh, explodes out into the universe and a lot of other things too. And there's other complicated processes and gravity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Planets are formed. This planet was formed. And uh, sediment, uh, glaciers, blah, blah, blah. And before you know it, northeastern Minnesota is home to one of the richest iron deposits in the world. And uh, uh, the spine of iron tingles in northern Minnesota, one of our great, greatest natural resources. But that's not all, folks. We've also got trees, lots of trees and, and forests. This is a white pine. Uh, actually, this is the last day of this white pine's life. This is on my property, and it was rotten to the core. We had to take it down. It was, my house is off, off screen here, and it was threatening the house. So we had to cut down this white pine, which is one of the reasons I loved moving out to this country lot where we live. This white pine that reminded me of a story that I read in the paper a few years ago. It was a story of a man addressing a historical society on the Iron Range in the 1930s. And he was telling a story from the late 1800s about ascending the Laurentian Divide near Virginia and looking out over a forest, a white pine forest that was gargantuan, that our modern imaginations probably can't fully comprehend. I know I try and I just can't comprehend this sea of massive white pine, dark green needles blowing in the wind, ebbing and flowing like a mighty sea is how he described it. And he had no camera, there was no way to record it, and all of those trees are gone. And white pines will never again reach that size and that number again, certainly not here in northeastern Minnesota, but we do offer a wide variety of quality wood products available for purchase. We are in Grand Rapids after all. 
Uh, this is water, another of the underrated, the, f the, the, the underdog. I, I put my money on water for the long haul. And, um, and this is the Hull Rust Mine Pit north of Hibbing. And I took this picture in 1998. I have to say that because Iron Range purists in here know that it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, the water's largely been pumped out. A lot of what you see has been mined. And uh, I, I point that out, A, because as Mark Twain says, uh, said once, he doesn't say it anymore, uh, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting wars over. And uh, water and our access to it here in northern Minnesota is going to be, I, I think, one of the underrated natural resources into the future. But also, um, this is just an example of how a landscape on the Iron Range can change rather quickly. And so the Iron Range, you see water, you see hills, uh, chances are it could have been put there by people, and we all know that they can be moved by people in the future. Five generations of people have moved and changed the land for better, for worse, and for the use of people. And it's go it goes on today, and it will go on into the future. So going into the history, I really can only say one thing about the history of the range to condense it down as much as possible. Waves of people have touched this place, this this Laurentian Divide, three-way watershed, this northeastern Arrowhead region. And from thousands of years ago, when native peoples first recognized the sacred nature of the unique land formations and resources available here, all the way until the last action-packed hundred years that a lot of us would be familiar with on the Iron Range, when immigrants poured into the region to uh, cut the timber and mine the ore, uh, different immigrant groups all came in with their own ideas, their own cultures, and washed over the rock of this place. Yes, changing the place, but in the process, the people were changed too. And the only way to look at range history is to look at, the, at it like it was a rock. Geological pressure, slow, steady pressure over time, punctuated by moments of human courage. And this is a moment of human courage from range history. Uh, uh, that's uh, the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies. This was a cartoon from one of their newspapers in, in the strike of 1916. That guy obviously represents the workers, and he's holding a club. The club reads, Organization, which at the time meant labor organization, uh, organizing the unskilled labor of the range from that time period. He is girding for a battle against a, a mob there, and of course an unsightly looking gentleman with the top hat, that would be, uh, you can't read it there, the Steel Trust, which is code. If you go into range history, it's code. When you hear someone complaining about the Steel Trust, you're hearing about people complaining about the powerful interests of the East, and the people from the outside trying to tell these hardworking folks that they uh, shouldn't have what's promised to them in life. And what is he seeking in the background there? The sun, the bright glowing sun, much like the star that exploded that sent the iron to this place, emancipation. Don't think about emancipation in relation to the Iron Range necessarily, but for a lot of the workers who are living and dying underground, and for others in the area who have lived and died over the years, showing great courage. Emancipation was the goal, and it was, we forget sometimes that it was won through World War II and in the time after. But for a lot of us who grew up on the range in the 1980s and 90s, people like myself, we were raised to believe there was no future, no hope, and no reason to stick around. Because it was all over, folks. Just like a gentleman said, who, who toured the range back in the 1910s and 20s, said that the iron beneath the ground of this place will doom it to destruction. Because they're going to mine all that iron, and it's going to be gone, and the communities are going to die. That is the fate of the Iron Range. And yet, a couple times in history, that we've, we've proven them wrong. We proved them wrong scientifically with the taconite process that's allowed the iron mining industry to continue. And we've proven them wrong uh, in other ways as well, as, as communities like this form to think of new ways to go into the future. But are we really going to get there? We have to have more courage, more courage like what we saw back in the strikes of 1907 and 1916. The people who fought for our towns and communities, who fought for the many great schools and uh, community buildings and institutions and arts communities that existed for the last hundred years here on, on the Iron Range and in towns around the Iron Range. Uh, that took people on the ground who actually fought for these things. And in a unique moment of history, it was made possible through courage. So what does that mean for today? 
this idea of courage? Well, like I said, we're fighting against fate, something that seems prescribed. So uh, some ways we can show courage today, I think, are, th are three things. I mentioned all of those resources, or wood products, and of course, water, which is worth fighting wars over. Um, these are, and other minerals too, uh, and, and all of these resources are things you hear about on the news a lot even today. These are natural resources, much like we've been in the natural resource economy of the last hundred plus years. I think it will take great courage for us as a people, the people who live here now over these resources, to understand that these are valuable resources, not just for the money that they represent, but also the power they represent in our communities. And I'm just going to talk Turkey. I mean, these are our things. These, are, these belong to the people. And it was early pioneers on the range who were able to harness uh, uh, mineral uh, taxation systems to keep this area alive through down mining times. And, and through those uh, early pioneers and leaders, uh, we still have communities and schools worth giving a darn about. And we're going to need to maintain that courage in recognizing that these, th these minerals and resources have value to our communities even today, even as economic desperation and fear sets in. We're going to have to have courage. We're also going to have to have courage to recognize that the income and the prosperity of the future might come from other areas. Indeed, it will have to, because we're never going to replace all those mining jobs lost in the 1980s. That's true. We will never replace the, all of those jobs in the same industry. We're going to have to replace them elsewhere, which means we're going to have to have the courage to go in on new technologies, including doing uh, things like uh, what I do and what my wife does. I teach online. I, uh, I work online. I produce content for the internet. My wife's an online entrepreneur who produces content for the internet. And we live in rural Itasca County. And uh, we need higher, higher speed internet than what we have to take our work to the next level. And my students that I see every day in my online classrooms are struggling to watch basic videos and things that matter to their education every day. And this is how people in the future are going to make their money. Are they going to make it here in northern Minnesota? We're going to have to get moving. And we're going to have to, whether it's a private or public sector, I don't care. If you are a pi private sector favored person or a public sector, sector favored person, go at it. I'm telling you to go for it because it will take courage and the first one to get there will, will win, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> and then finally, um, our communities. Empowering and emboldening our communities to do more, just as those early uh, pioneers in our communities did 100 years ago when they built the Hibbing High School, when they built the Hibbing City Hall with, with the money from the mining industry that the mining industry gave away because the communities demanded it. Those immigrant laborers demanded better for their kids. And we're going to have to do the same using a lot of the ideas we're hearing about today. Absolutely. But we're going to have to do it on the local level, in our communities, in our school boards, on our city councils, county boards. Uh, a lot of people uh, who uh, have lived on the range the last 30 years have been waiting for some kind of uh, outside power to come in and save us, whether it's through some kind of government action or some kind of big company coming in to bring um, a job-creating machine of some kind that produces jobs, uh, just spits them out a tube or something. Uh, none of those things are going to happen. Those aren't going to happen. What, what, what can happen is people in the communities, doing a little bit every day to make the communities more livable. Quality of life is the new commodity. And focusing inward on the communities of the range and what's wrong there. And if you drive through, if you, we, we look through, the, through our past lenses. We see the old this and the old that, the things that used to be there that are now closed. People who come through with new eyes see uh, a lot of void and a lot of areas where old can be made new through a little bit of effort. And with this kind of courage, we can start living the good life in northern Minnesota, a life that involves courage, a life that involves something better for our kids, which is all the immigrant uh, ancestors ever wanted for us, all the native peoples who ever fought and died for this place. All they ever wanted was for their children to grow up in a better place and to have just a little bit of courage to keep it going for their kids too. Thank you.